We're in the countdown to the 2024 Informs Analytics Conference in Orlando, Florida, April 14th through the 16th, when more than 700 leading analytics professionals and industry experts will come together to discover new solutions to business problems, connect and network, and celebrate excellence in the field. Joining me to give a sneak peek of this year's conference is Tom Kulopoulos, the Informs Roundtable-sponsored keynote speaker. Tom is an author, futurist and leader who serves as chairman and founder of Delphi Group, a 30-year-old Boston-based think tank named one of the fastest growing private companies by Inc. Magazine, as well as the founding partner of AcroVantage Ventures, which invests in early stage technology startups. He's also the author of 14 books, an inventor with several patents, an Inc.com columnist, the past executive director of the Babson College Center for Business Innovation, the past director of Dell Innovation Lab, and a professor at Boston University. I'm so excited for the opportunity to get to know Tom, explore his own professional journey, and share an exciting sneak peek at what he'll be presenting at the upcoming conference. So Tom, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Ashley. It's such a pleasure to be here with you. So Tom, I'd love to start by exploring your professional title author, futurist, and leader, which by the way is a great title. It totally blows communications manager out of the water. How do you identify with these three roles? Obviously you're a published author many times over, but I'd love to know how you feel you embody each of these in your day-to-day -day professional life and how these roles relate to each other. Gosh, I, I love that. That's a great way to begin. I, you know, I think that someone told me a long time ago, the most important thing in life is caring. Uh, caring about what you do, caring about the people that you work with, that you work for, that work for you. You know, the title is whatever the title is. I think at the end of the day, I care so much about the future that we're going to be passing on to our kids, what it will look like, the world that they will inhabit. I think we've got enormous challenges ahead of us, and I care about solving those challenges, but I care about being an optimist as well. And I think all too often we get very pessimistic about the future. And there's a lot of reasons to be pessimistic, but there's a lot of reasons to be optimistic as well. And I think caring ultimately is an act of optimism. When we care, we believe that something good will come out of that. So whether it's in leadership, whether it's in writing, whether it's in speaking, uh, whether it's in thinking about the future, I think at the end of the day, it's all about caring about the world we inhabit and how we're going to take on some of these challenges and take them on with a bit of a smile on our face, uh, as difficult as that as that is. I tell people all the time, these are the good times. And they look at me and they say, but they can't, if you're in healthcare, how can you say that? Because unfortunately, crisis is when we grow, crisis is when we change. And if we care about the world that we live in, then we take that crisis. And I think we use it as an opportunity to, to change and to grow. So that's the best that I've, I've got for, you know, what, what drives me at the end of the day. It's that caring about what I do, the people that I work with. I love that response so much. And if I may be so bold, I think you should add optimist to that as well. Thank you. <laughs> so as both the co-founder and chairman of the Delphi Group Think Tank and the founding partner of AcroVantage Ventures, you've been involved from the start in two organizations that are focused on innovation, technological advancement, and idea generation, and lots of other exciting opportunities, I'm sure. I'd love to hear more about the kind of work that's going on at these two organizations. So both Delphi and AcroVantage are focused on the same thing, trying to make sense of the leading edge. And I think the leading edge can often uh, be a bit obtuse. I think that folks that live on the leading edge try to make it obtuse because they build a priesthood around it. And the idea behind Delphi Group 30 plus years ago was to try to take that leading edge that was confusing, complex, sometimes inaccessible to mere mortals like ourselves, and make it understandable, make it accessible. And that's what we do with Delphi Group. We look at that leading edge, try to simplify what's going on, whether it be AI or whether it be Google search or whatever the case might be. We've been involved in so many technologies over the years. We try to make it accessible and understandable because at the end of the day, it is us mere mortals that make the change. I mean, Elon Musk is doing amazing things, um, will take us to new planets and will make a multi-planetary civilization out of us. But it is us mere mortals who have to buy into these big ideas. And the problem is that these ideas are sometimes difficult to grasp. So Delphi Group makes them understandable, brings them down to earth. And look, I'm a simple-minded person, so I need to make it simple for me to understand it. And if I can then understand it, I stand a chance of getting others to understand it as well. Acro Ventures is sort of at the leading edge of that leading edge. So we look at companies that are very involved 
in uh, what we think are going to be growth areas. So one of those areas is data. And we'll talk about that more, I'm sure, over the course of our conversation today. So we invest in companies that are uh, putting in place uh, mechanisms by which we can store this vast amount of data and then use AI to make sense of it, uh, to really change the way industries operate and the way that we live, that we work, that we that we play. So that's sort of where Delphi and, and Acro both sort of fit in to the future. So now if all that wasn't enough, you're also a published author several times over. Um, I'd love to have you just share a brief synopsis of your work and some of the topics you've covered. So the latest topic, which I'm so excited about <clears throat> in the current book, Gigatrans, which just came out as we're speaking right now, and, and which, by the way, sold out six times on Amazon in the last two days, which is not what an author wants. <laughs> it's good news, bad news, but it's such a popular topic. Gigatrans looks at how AI is going to help us take on six of the biggest challenges that we face as a global civilization. These aren't just US-centric uh, challenges, these are global challenges, healthcare, within 20 years across the globe is gonna be suffering immensely because we're all getting older. So the giga trend of an aging demographic is gonna put severe strain on the world. How will AI help us with that? And, and it will. So we look at six uh, major themes in terms of challenges and opportunities to change and how AI will address each of those. And I'm really excited about this because I think we are at a very peculiar point as a civilization where without AI, we don't stand a chance. So it's not us versus AI. It's not human versus AI, which is the way it's often portrayed. It is AI and human versus the future. I think that's the way to look at it. How do we collaborate as a team to take on climate change, to take on the 4 billion people, actually, who today live on less than $7 a day? I mean, 4 billion out of 8 billion live on less than $7 a day. That's I can't even begin to grasp how we get out of that sort of, of wealth inequality. So how does AI help us with that? And it does. It help us to, helps us to bring those folks on board in a way that's not going to choke the planet the way we did with the industrial era technologies that we so adeptly use to scale uh, consumerism. So we look at those really challenging issues and how AI will help us to, uh, to address them. I love the idea of, of working with AI to tackle the future. That's such a, <laughs> an exciting um, perspective. It's a lot better than looking at it as our overlord. I, exactly. This, <laughs> how AI is going to you know, make humanity extinct. It'll push this button that says, you know what, you're to blame. So there you go. I, I don't buy into that. I'm sorry. I just, I just don't. I think we have to be aware of the ethics around AI. AI. I think we have to be conscious of what we're building. But look, at the end of the day, with every technology, look at nuclear technologies. Um, nuclear weapons are one of the most horrific things that mankind's ever created. And yet, out of that same technology came nuclear medicine, which has saved countless lives. So what humanity is always challenged with is, is a net benefit. Now, look at it as an income statement. As long as that net benefit exceeds the liabilities and the expenses of the technology, then it's worth moving forward with. And I think with every technology, there's a good side and a bad side to it. It can be used by unscrupulous bad actors, and it can be used by wonderful, magnificent, caring people. And we just need more of this than we have of this. And I don't care what the technology is, whether it's AI or what have you, it's always the same conversation. Yep, that's a terrific perspective. I love it. So this next question is really sort of just for fun. As someone who's written 14 books and not too... I presume that you've ever had writer's block, but if you were to have, do you have a tried and true method to overcome it? Writer's block is a constant companion. Uh, anyone who tells you otherwise is either Tolstoy or Hemingway. And I'm, I'm sure they had writer's block as well, by the way. Uh, but when you write by the pound or by the kilo, I guess writer's block, you know, you eventually come get over it. Look, I think every author deals with a writer's block. Um, the solution is very simple. And, and most folks don't want to hear this. It is relentless discipline. When I'm writing a book, I get up every morning and I write at least 500 words. Now, they're not brilliant words most often. Uh, most often they end up in the trash heap. That's the piece of it. That's the discipline that most folks don't want to um, adopt because they want everything they write to be wonderful, uh, to somehow express profound ideas. I'm sorry. It's like going to the gym. Some days you want to go to the gym. Other days you drag your sorry Mm, you know what into, into the gym because you have to do it um every day is not going to give you that oxytocin boost uh mm -hmm. at the gym some days will some days are just you know excruciating and the same with writing so the discipline is you get up every day 
you write a certain number of words and you expect that at least half of them being generous, at least half will never see the light of day. Uh, and over time, you build that muscle and you find that voice. And once you do, it's magnificent, but it's not magnificent every single day. Uh, a very a wonderful editor once said to me, everyone wants to have written, no one wants to write. And I think that's every author, I think, would subscribe to that philosophy. <laughs> Yep, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> it's a lot of hard work. I can only imagine. So Tom, of all the different roles you've embodied and experiences you've had, do you have a favorite project or memory or maybe even a, a challenge that you overcame that still resonates for you to this day? So I'll, I'll be completely transparent and vulnerable. I think the greatest challenge I had to overcome was, uh, and this sounds very cliche because it's become popular to say this lately, but to embrace sort of vulnerability. You know, when you're up on stage, it's not the audience in their underwear, it's you in your underwear. You're the one who's naked. You're the one who, and it took me a while to really understand the power of being fully vulnerable because when you're vulnerable, you're authentic. And as human beings, boy, we can sniff out authenticity. Even when you know, in the back of your head, that, that intuition is saying, I shouldn't trust this person. You shouldn't um, because we can sniff out authenticity. We know when someone is being themselves, when they're being vulnerable and when they're acting or when they're playing playing a part. So unless you're a Brad Pitt and you can pull it off, you know, marvelously, most of us can't. We're either ourselves or we're going to raise red flags. So I think embracing that vulnerability and truly putting my ideas and myself out there to be chastised, uh, to be put down, uh, to be otherwise laughed at. I often say my biggest core competence is that I lack the embarrassment gene. I, I just, you know, <laughs> I get embarrassed and I keep doing it. Um, until I figure it out. So I, I, I think that embracing vulnerability and truly, you know, being my fully authentic self has been the greatest piece of my journey and the greatest challenge that I've that I've faced. Um, and I continue to face, we all continue to, to, to face it. Um, but yeah, what a wonderful question. Thank you for getting deep with me. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's terrific. And I would I would add that when someone is authentic and vulnerable, the quality of the connections you can make with them just skyrocket. So that's that's really terrific. Such a wonderful point. That is so true. That is the way you really connect with mm -hmm. people. And you, you allow them, you give them license um, to express their own vulnerability, right? To be open with you. I, that's a wonderful point. Yes, completely agree. All right, Tom, without giving too much away, could you give us a sneak peek at what you'll be presenting at the 2024 Informs Analytics Conference? Right. So without giving too much away, look, I think one of the greatest and most magnificent challenges that we have to face is AI and how we will co-inhabit uh, the future with it. AI, at the end of the day, is all about data. Uh, we talk about why is AI suddenly, why is chat GPT suddenly become such a phenomenon? Why is generative AI such a phenomenon? Look, the reason is that the cornerstones of that, the algorithms were there. What wasn't there was the data. And what we have now is this enormous abundance of data. One of the companies that we've invested in, we did a lot of research for initially to see what that data sphere would look like going down the road. Here's a stat for you that is, if this isn't mind blowing, I don't know what is. By the year 2200, if we continue at a 30% year-over-year growth rate in the amount of data that we're capturing and storing, we will have more bits of data than there are atoms that make up the Earth, which to me, I mean, mind-blown. How that's, is that even possible? Astounding. Right? Absolutely astounding. At 100% year-over-year growth rate, which we could very well reach when we look at genomics and autonomous vehicles and autonomous devices, at 100% year-over-year growth rate... <laughs> I feel silly even saying this, but the numbers are the numbers. We will have more bits of data than there are atoms in the visible universe. Again, I, yeah. you know, I, I can't wrap my little brain around that. I was going to say it's almost impossible to to even we can't head around it. You can't yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. The question is, what do we do with that data? And you know, there are all these cliches: data is the new oil, data is a commodity. You know what? It, it, it fuels the future, but it's not the new oil, because if you have a bucket of gasoline, I have a bucket of gasoline, we'll trade. It's no problem. Your gas is as good as my gas. Um, you know, the barrel of oil is a barrel of oil. Uh, data is very personal. I'm not going to give you my email if you give me your email. It doesn't quite work that way. And one company won't trade with another company. It's data. Data is very personal and very valuable. It is the single most valuable commodity any of us will have as individuals, as organizations, as societies. Yeah. Who's going to be the caretaker 
of that data? Who's going to help us understand that data? And it's not, the answer is not AI. And this is what I want to focus on at the, at the event. It is the people who are most adept at understanding how to work with AI as a collaborator in mining this enormous resource. Mm -hmm. And this is the resource that will help us overcome climate change. It is the resource that will help us overcome uh, the healthcare crisis. It is the resource that will help us deal with uh, transportation that otherwise will choke the planet if we continue on the trajectory that we're currently on in terms of, of vehicles. So there is no single greater task ahead of us, I think, than being the caretakers, the orchestrators, and the analyzers of that data. And, and I, you know, I mean that with enormous sincerity because I've seen up close and personal uh, how incredibly powerful that data can be and how often it's not being used or misused or simply misunderstood. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to share that enthusiasm and the tools and the techniques and the methods by which I think this is going to take shape over the next uh, five to 10 to 20 years. So your attendees are the attendees that will be those caretakers. They are the collaborators. They will be yeah. working shoulder to shoulder with AI uh, to mine this enormous resource that we have now. So cool speak stuff. to the attendees. Let's imagine ahead of time, uh, it's the conference. You've just given your presentation. The attendees are, you know, walking out of the uh, the yeah. room. What do you hope are the biggest takeaway or takeaways that they're taking taking with them as they leave and go back to their prospective roles and organizations? Yeah. But so number one, AI is a collaborator. I will work with it in the way I work with any other team member. It is a protege. It is an assistant. Call it what you want. It, it is a collaborator that I will work with. Uh, number two, I am in a position of enormous empowerment uh, where I will have the responsibility and the opportunity to do incredible things going forward with this new uh, collaborator. And three, a sense of optimism. You know, the future looks pretty damn good. Um, there's a lot of reasons why we could uh, speak of gloom and doom. I'm not going to. Uh, there's lots of that out there. At the end of the day, I think there's a lot more reasons to be optimistic about the future and the role that your attendees will play in it. Well, I, for one, am very excited to hear your uh, presentation, and I'm sure all of our listeners are too. But if they want to hear more, they're going to have to register for the conference. So we're going to move on to the next question. Okay. Um, so Tom, to change gears a little, what's something unique about you that others might not know? <laughs> um, wow. Um, well, I'm an artist. I love to paint. I love to sculpt. Uh, I don't talk about it much. And unless you've been to my home, most folks come after knowing me for 10 or 15 years and they they say, wow, you, you paint? Um, so it's it's my therapy, it's my release. I don't do it daily. I sometimes don't even do it monthly, but it's it's a way for me to sort of express my my creativity in a very different way, uh, a, a non cerebral mm -hmm. way. So I love to do that. I love to fly. I learned to fly when I was in my late teens. I don't get to do it often enough, but yeah, those are those are two things that I take enormous joy in and give me a a, a different um, way to use sort of my creative side of my mm -hmm. brain and to experience uh, joy outside of my writing and my speaking and the other things that I do. That's terrific. So do you, do you have your own plane? Uh, I do not have my own. Oh. <laughs> um, I, I don't fly often enough that I think at this point I would fly my own plane. Um, but I, but I, but I do fly with friends uh, mm -hmm. quite often. And the next best thing to having a friend with a nice boat is a friend with a nice plane. <laughs> exactly. It's it's sometimes a better deal that way. Same with a pool, I think. You got it. Exactly. <laughs> All right. So you obviously have a lot going on. Um, what do you do to relax? What does your downtime look like? A lot of time spent in front of the fireplace with my dog, Luna. <laughs> I think sometimes you have to give your brain a break and really not think about anything, which for those of us that think a lot, that's what mm -hmm. we do for a living. It, it can it can be a bit overwhelming sometimes. Um, I love to travel. Uh, travel is part of my DNA. I've got wanderlust that's woven into my 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 genome, I think. I've been doing it since I was a few months old. So I love traveling. Um, and as I said, flying is a great escape for me. It's it's a way to literally leave the planet and leave all of your worries yeah. behind. Uh, I love that. Below. So if you were not working in the field that you're in, uh, what do you think you'd be doing today? <laughs> I'd be very depressed. <laughs> I, think, um, I can't imagine. You know what? It, this sounds cliche again. I can't imagine doing anything else. Maybe being an astronaut. I mean, I, I can sort of envision in, in my fantasy world, you know, a, a fighter pilot doing other things. I'm not sure I'd be qualified for either one of those jobs. I'm nowhere near as brilliant as people who do those uh, kinds of things are. 
I, I love what I do. And I genuinely think that um, were I not doing this, I would not be as happy of a person as I, as I am. That's the best way to answer that, I think. <laughs> that is the, the perfect answer. <laughs> So uh, in this interview, we've obviously covered a wide range of your roles and activities um, of, of all of these, big and small. Is there one that you are the most proud of? Oh, goodness. Uh, being a dad. I mean, none of the, we haven't talked about that at all, but that is the, the, you know, and not proud, not proud in an arrogant way, proud in a sort of sitting back and watching your kids evolve into something that is yeah. much greater than you could ever be. I think, I know for anyone who's been a parent that there is no greater joy or, or thing that you take more pride in than than that simple act of observing uh, your children come into their own. So certainly, certainly that. A close second would be um, my writing. I, I love to write, and I take great joy in it. I think pride might be a little, might be stretching it because you know I, I I do what I do because I love doing it. It's up to other people to tell me whether I should be proud of it or, or not. I guess, uh, but that would be a close second. Okay. So looking ahead to the future, um, not that you haven't done enough, but I'd love to hear what's next for you. Is there a new goal, a bucket list item, maybe a new hobby or activity that you're looking forward to tackling in the future? I would love to hear what's next for me as well. I, you know, I, I, I tend to surprise people sometimes. I don't plan my life out that, that precisely. I think the, uh, the universe or whatever you believe in tends to uh, deliver things that you're not asking for. Uh, but which end up being the things that you really need in your life. So I'm going to wait and see what the universe delivers. Um, there is one thing I would love to do and I'm planning on doing, which is sort of a bucket list item. Uh, and that is flying a spitfire over the white cliffs of Dover. I've got a friend of mine who's a pilot and we've been trying to coordinate this for some time now. And you can do that. There are spitfires, these World War II planes that, you know, won World War II for, uh, for Britain uh, that you can fly over the white cliffs of Dover, that iconic, scene uh where so many battles uh, occurred so yeah that is a, a definite bucket list item that and going into orbit at some point yeah <laughs> so, so fun fact i was watching a special on netflix last night it was world war ii uh remastered in color and wow. they talked a lot about the spitfire so <laughs> yeah. spitfire and the mustang two very iconic planes that you know the mustang was the american plane and the mm -hmm. uh, spitfire was the and these are just incredible machines and they they keep them up they still have a fleet of them uh, you That's can't incredible. fly it alone. I would love if they would let me do that, but I, <laughs> I don't think you know what you're doing, they first, should. <laughs> no, I think I have to put down a rather hefty deposit to be able to do, <laughs> to do that. Um, but I'm okay. I'm okay doing it as co-pilot. I'll take, I'll take that. Well, I hope that is a bucket list achieved in the very near future. That sounds thank like you. an incredible experience. Tom, thank I had so much fun. I want to thank you again so much for taking the time to talk with me today. Um, I'm excited to see to meet you and to see your presentation in Orlando in just a few weeks. I am so excited to be there. Thank you so much, Ashley. This was wonderful. I really enjoyed it.